My name is Mike Eckers. I, I reside in Owatonna. Um, don't hold it against me. Uh, it, it, it's strange. I've been there 24 years. I grew up in St. Louis Park and I moved to Owatonna by way of San Diego. That's how I tell people I've kind of lived around different places. Uh, I spent four years in the Navy, uh, home ported out of San Diego. That's how I got introduced to the, some of the finest weather in the United States. And when uh, my wife and I got married after my stint in the Navy and I was working carrying mail for the Postal Service, which is also it's the greatest place in the world to carry mail, in nine years I wore shorts all but one day. I got rained on once and it wasn't even my fault. <laughs> so I came back here after nine years of carrying mail and my first day was the day after President's Day. So it was February of 1990 and the first day I carried mail in Owatonna the the temperature was 30 below <laughs> and the wind chill was I have no idea but I, I went out to carry mail and I walked around the corner of a house and my left eye froze shut my eyelashes actually froze together so I had to I backed back around the corner took off my gloves melted the, the ice put my gloves back on walked around the corner and my right eye froze shut <laughs> And it was at that point that I thought, what on earth have I done <laughs> moving back here? But uh, things, things got better after that. Uh, I, by the way, I was the only carrier who actually delivered his mail that day in Owatonna. Everybody else came in. My supervisor thought I was frozen out there somewhere. And when I came in later in the afternoon, everybody else had come and gone and they left the mail to be delivered the next day. And, my boss said, uh, are you okay? I went, absolutely. And he goes, what were you doing out there? I said, I was delivering the mail. And he goes, well, nobody delivers mail in this kind of weather. I said, what happened to that rain or sleet or dark of night? <laughs> and he goes, fairy tales, man. <laughs> I'm going, well, in San Diego, I never didn't deliver the mail. And he goes, well, you never had 30 below temperatures in San Diego either. And he was right. Anyway, but I'm, I'm a native Minnesotan, so I live here, although I'm not a native Owatonnan, and they remind me of that all the time. I speak there a lot, and every time at least one person comes up and says, oh, you're not from here, are you? I'm like, I've lived here 24 years, I've raised three kids in Owatonna, they're all three graduates of Owatonna High, but I'm not from there. So I've gotten used to that. So instead, I, I, describe, I introduce myself as someone whose family has lived in Minnesota since 1842. Beat that. So anyway, it's <laughs> not that I'm bragging, but my roots go deep in this, in this state, and I love Minnesota. So most of the history I write is about Minnesota. I've written a series of books, and I'll talk about them for just a minute so that I don't forget, because my business manager, who's also known as Diane, my wife of 35 years, um, always has to remind me to talk about my books. So I've written six books to date. I'm working on two more right now. Some of my books are a, a series of historical fiction novels about my family, although I changed their name. So I didn't want my name associated with these characters. They're called the Weldon Family. They're written for a sixth grade and up reading level. Um, there's no graphic violence, sorry guys. There's no sex, sorry. Uh, my first book has two kisses in it, and one of them is with his mom. Okay, so it, my wife describes my writing as Hallmark movies wrapped in paper. Um, that's kind of what I write. I've written one nonfiction story, which is the, a book about a group of, of men from Dodge County, south of here, who uh, went from Manterville and Wasioja into the Civil War as Company C of the Second Minnesota. Most of them came from a town called Wasioja. Yeah. So uh, publishing that book in 2010, the year before the Susquecentennials made my life real busy. Because suddenly they, we wanted to do this reenactment and then somebody made a movie out of it and I'm traveling around the country promoting this video, this movie that was made out of my book. And I learned that if someone says, we'd like to do a movie out of your book, just say no. If you're going to be retired, just say no. No thanks, that's okay. Or you can do that, but I'm not going to be a part of it, you know, type thing. So that's what I've learned. But today, we're not going to go quite as far back as 1860s. We're just going to go back one generation. We're going to go back to World War II. 
We're going to start in 1941 when World War II started, and we're going to go from there. So strap on your seat belts. We're going to do a little bit of time travel. Okay? If you have questions, feel free to, to just ask your questions during the talk. If you have comments, I'll ask you to talk to me afterwards when I kind of mosey over to the table. If you want to buy books, the books are $10, no sales tax. I cover that with the governor. Um, I mean, he really does take it from me at the end of the year, but um, I take care of that. I, I do have a small book for $5. It's, it's called Losing Your Zip. It's, it's the story of a 28-year postal career, which I was the postmaster of Denison. Uh, I was the postmaster of Dodge Center when I retired. And so a lot of the characters, the names are changed to protect the guilty. I never protect innocent people. They don't need protection. Um, you might recognize some of the people in there by their description or traits, especially those in Denison. That's not very far uh, from here. So let's go to the 8th Air Force in World War II. World War II began for the United States December 7th, 1941, with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. About 12 days later, um, an idea was formed in Washington that we need to do something, some way to get at the Germans. Because on, on December 8th, we declared war on Japan, but we were not, at that time, we were not at war with Germany. Germany did us that favor. Hitler's, perhaps his biggest mistake was declaring war on the United States on December 10th. We didn't have to declare war on Germany, they did it for us. When they declared war on us, it was exactly what Roosevelt and Churchill were hoping Germany would do, and they did. And so we, be, we started this two-front war. We were fighting the Japanese, we were fighting the Germans. At the time, we could not get at Germany. We couldn't fight them. We didn't have an army on the field. We were just rearming ourselves. We had been providing all of our first-line equipment was going in the form of Lend-Lease, was going to England. Uh, now it would be also going to Russia, since we were now in a shooting war with Germany. And so it, it would take us a while to build up armed forces, land forces, armies to attack Germany. So how do we get at Germany? Well, we can get at them through the air. And that's basically what started. January 2nd, 1942, so three weeks after Pearl, the 8th Bomber Command was formed down in Savannah, Georgia. It was formed with a total of four officers. That's, that was the beginning of the 8th Bomber Command that would eventually morph into the 8th Air Force. Um, it's interesting to note that, uh, and this is kind of a sidetrack because it's another talk I do, when did the first ground forces from the United States actually go to Europe? It was also in January of 1942. So it was only a month after the war began that we actually sent ground forces to England. Actually, we sent them to Ireland. Does anybody know who those guys were? 34th Red Bull. Thank you, the 34th Red Bull, exactly. I'm doing a story on that for next week. Oh, cool, cool. Um, and I'll be speaking Thursday night down in Austin on them for, for Moore County. But the Red Bull from, from Minnesota, Minnesota National Guard. So guys from here were the first to go to England. In fact, the first guy to step foot in England for the U.S. Army was a guy whose last name was Henke. He happened to be from Hutchinson, Minnesota, recognized as the first soldier to go fight in World War II. So just like in the Civil War, when the first Minnesota, Mr. Colville included, were the first troops offered to fight the Confederacy, in World War II, the first guys to get there were Americans, were Minnesotans. So that's not why I live here, but it's just kind of cool. I like Minnesota history. So January of 42, they formed the 8th Bomber Command. In March of 1942, the 8th had expanded to about 13 men, 13 officers. So these 13 officers head over to England in March of 1942 to establish liaison and relations with the Royal Air Force and to pick a spot where the command was going to be located. So these were all uh, officers that one was a a specialist in logistics, one was in personnel, and, and so forth. So they were going to go over and begin setting up airfields, contracting with the British to build them, working with the Royal Air Force. So they get to England, and the RAF suggests that we locate our 8th Air Force Command headquarters 
about a half a mile from RAF Bomber Command headquarters. And there happened to be this school, it was a girls' school, that was located there and all the girls had been moved out and the government of, of Great Britain had taken over the school and had reserved it for the use of the 8th Air Force. So they moved into this girls' school and they codenamed that location Pine Tree. Pine Tree became the location, or the, the, that code name for the 8th Air Force headquarters. So the first night, there was a duty officer, first night in this school, former girls' school, and these, these 12 officers are asleep, one is on duty down at the front desk, and he hears these little bells tinkling. And at first he thought maybe they were in his head, but they weren't, he could actually hear the bells tinkling. So he got up and walked around and there was nothing wrong, he walked up and down the hallways, nothing going on, went back to his duty station. Well, he found out the next morning what the bells were because in each of the girls' former girls' school bedrooms, which, by the way, were painted pink and white, okay, for these 8th Air Force officers, in each bedroom next to each bed was a pull rope that had a sign on it. And it said, if during the night you need a mistress, ring the bell. <laughs> and so we learned right away that there was this language difference <laughs> between America and, and the English. And I love that, that um, Winston Churchill once said that, that the United States and England are, are a single people separated by a common language. You know? <laughs> so um, later on, you would, there was this expression that the British would use, kind of poking fun at the Americans. And it really was this verbal, verbal kind of dueling back and forth, this jousting, as the British would say. The British like to say that the problem with the Americans is that we were overpaid, oversexed and over here. <laughs> That's what the British said. The, and the Americans would counter that with, well, the problem with the, the English is that they're underpaid, undersexed, and under Eisenhower. <laughs> and so <laughs> this verbal bantering went on through, throughout the war. But we did do a real good job of fighting together. And it even came down to the way our two air forces were used. Royal Air Force, their bomber command, would bomb Germany at night. They had tried daylight bombing, but the losses incurred to the German fighter, uh, fighter command were just so horrendous. They were losing up to 30% of their bomber force, and they couldn't sustain those kind of losses. So the British switched to night area bombing. Now you cannot pick out a specific factory at night, but you can find a city. So if you bomb that city, you have a, a fair chance of hitting that factory. And as Bomber Harris, the commander of the Royal Air Force, said, he didn't matter if, if they hit the, the factory or if they hit the workers who worked in the factory. We were keeping them awake at night. They were not getting sleep. They were having to fight fires. We were killing their workers. We might even hit the factory. So that was his idea. Eventually, it, he, he expanded that. By the end of the war, the British Bomber Command at night were destroying entire cities. They would go over with a thousand bombers at night and they might hit that hit a town three or four nights in a row and they would literally burn out 80 to 90 percent of that city so that by the end of world war ii there were over 300 cities in germany that were 80 to 90 percent destroyed so it, it helps to begin to understand the rebuilding process in europe after the war in the united states we were in the forefront of that. We paid for most of the reconstruction in Europe, actually during the 1940s and 50s. So that was part of that, that expansion in industry, et cetera, in the United States. Guys came back from the war, well, what are they gonna do? Well, they're gonna build stuff that we're gonna then ship to England and, and distribute throughout Europe. Food and everything else went to Europe under the Marshall Plan, the rebuilding of, of Europe. So after these 12, 13 officers get there in March, things start happening fairly quickly. By May, they had their first aircraft had arrived. And, and the aircraft that they, they flew over were B-17 bombers. It was a, a fairly new bomber. We had given the British some of them during uh, our Lend-Lease in 1940 and early 41 before we got into the war. The British, <coughs> suggested some modifications to the B-17. Uh, the tail was reconfigured, uh, bigger engines were put on it, making it more powerful. So the 8th Air Force 
again decided we were going to go with daylight precision bombing. And we'll get into that. The British didn't like that idea. They wanted us to join them bombing Germany at night. But we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, oops, got to turn on my dongle here so we can advance slides. This is why it worked. Even President Roosevelt got it right. He said when Hitler built walls around fortress Europe, he forgot to put a roof on it. The only way we could get at Germany was through the air. And so that was our main offensive uh, push for the first two years of the war. I can maybe get that focused in a little better there. Maybe not. That's going to be about it. This happens to show a flight of B-17s along with their fighter escorts and the contrails up above. These are the fighter escorts here, the P-38s at that time. Um, that was the one thing you could not do in the air was hide. Because of these contrails, the Germans knew exactly where you were coming from and where you were going. Even without radar to pinpoint you, they knew where you were. They used radar to determine exactly your altitude so that they could then fire their anti-aircraft guns at the proper altitude to try and knock you down. So how do you go about building an air force? Well, you've got to figure out the structure of it first. So the entire 8th Air Force, here's the 8th Air Force and their emblem, was divided into bomb groups. Eventually, there were nearly 40 bomb groups divided into three different bombardment wings. First, second, and third wings, or ABC. This happens to be the emblem of the 401st bomb group, and I'll explain why, that, why I chose that one. In, in a bomb group, you have four squadrons. Each squadron has approximately 12 aircraft. So you would have about 48 or so aircraft in a bombardment group. Each B-17, by the way, had an air crew of 10. There were 10 men inside that B-17. So it gives you an idea of the scope of how big the 8th Air Force began, became, and we'll, we'll deal with numbers in a bit. But really, it got all the way down to an individual aircraft. This individual aircraft, you can see it's got that triangle S. So it's the 401st bomb group. The IY, the call letters IY, identify it as part of the 615th squadron. And based on the, the, the letter Q and the tail number, I took this photo and I went, okay, well that was IYQ. And there were three different IYQs in the life of this squadron because as a plane got shot down, it would, a new plane would replace it perhaps with a different name but with the same tail letter the same call letter, because you only had 26 letters in the alphabet. And if you have 12 planes in a squadron, eventually you're going to have to reuse letters. So um, IYQ, this particular IYQ was tag along. And as a historian, I saw this picture and I went, okay, I want to find out everything I can about this photo because my father flew in that plane during the war. I saw this picture, I went, I identified the plane and the name of the plane rang a bell. My dad actually flew in five different aircraft, which was pretty, pretty common. Um, if your plane was damaged, you would take the plane of another crew that may be standing down a mission because they had just flown the day before. A lot of reasons for that. So IYQ. So what can you tell me about this photo? Well, I can tell you that it's a B-17G model, so it's got to be after 1943. My dad flew this plane actually in the, the summer of 1944 for a mission. It's being modified here. They're working on the ball turret underneath. In the winter of 1944-45, this plane was modified to, they took out the tail gunner position, so they took the guns out of the belly turret, and they put in a ray dome so they, for radar bombing. So that modification was done over the winter of 44-45. So I knew this picture was taken during the winter. But how do you get it closer than that? By looking at the meteorological records of England, there was only two days that winter where there was enough snow to actually stay on the ground in Deanthorpe, which is the town where uh, my father was stationed and, and Tagalong was based. So I, by deduction, this picture was taken on January 10th, 1945. My father is already in a prison camp by this time. Okay, But we'll get to that later too. But that's what's interesting about photos when you take a look at photos as a historian and you start really taking them apart and looking at them closely, you can figure out a lot of information 
more than just looking at the photo. So January 10th, 45 was when this picture was taken. The war is almost over. By the way, the 615th Squadron's insignia was designed by a Disney artist, as a lot of them were in the 8th Air Force, and they represent uh, Eisenhower, Churchill, and Stalin. Those are the faces on the bombs, the big three. So that was kind of their, their, their emblem there. During the course of the war, we learned some things. At the beginning of the war, when we had our aircraft arriving in England, and we started to divide them into groups and squadrons and, and everything else, which came after 1942, because once you start getting a couple of hundred aircraft, you have to now divide them into these different groups and wings and everything else, you started putting letters on them. Well, early in the war, we painted each B-17, came in an olive drab upper and, and light gray bottom. So if you looked at them from below, you'd see light gray would blend in with the sky. If you looked at them from above, olive drab would blend in with the ground over Europe. Problem with that, one, you had to pay painters to paint them. That was a problem because it increased the cost of the plane. You also had to buy the paint, which was not cheap. That also increased the price of each aircraft. The biggest problem was that it took 2,000 pounds of paint to paint one of these planes. Now, what's the purpose of a bomber? Is it to look pretty over, over the skies of your enemy? No, it's to drop bombs. Well, 2,000 pounds is four 500 pound bombs. That was a general purpose bomb that we used were 500 pounders. And so by not painting it, not only did they save the price of the, the, the labor of painting it, the cost of the paint, they were able to get four more bombs in it. Those are all positive things. The biggest thing they noticed was when you paint an aircraft, it increases the drag on a plane. So it actually takes more fuel to go through the air than if you leave it in that shiny aluminum that they come out of the aircraft factory at Boeing up in Redmond, Washington. So, or Wichita Falls or any of the other plants that were turning out B-17s. So the first modification or first change they did was they stopped painting them. And they started coming out in that shiny aluminum. And they were able to load more bombs in it, they were able to save money with it, and it flew better. But that triangle S is hard to spot from a long ways away. So eventually each wing developed a, a, a color system. So you had a slash, uh, it's called a flash, excuse me. Uh, yellow was, was the second bombardment wing. And so you would see this yellow flash and you knew yellow flash, triangle S, you knew what group and eventually what squadron that plane was from. So you could identify it a long ways off. And that was primarily for fighter escorts. So that fighters could join up with the bombers. They knew that they were joining up with the correct group, but it also allowed uh, the bomber pilots to form into their formations because they knew that they had, to, they had to come in alongside this certain group. Well, how do you know those planes are from that group? Now you can tell. Okay, so that's kind of the, the, uh, the morphing or the, the, the change in identification over the course of the war. The Boeing B-17, G Flying Fortress was a marvel of engineering. It was an amazing aircraft. It was not pressurized. So when you flew at altitude, if, if you were flying at 30,000 feet, the outside temperature was about 60 degrees below zero. Okay, it's pretty cold. In fact, it's very cold. If you take your gloves off to clear a jammed gun, your hands will stick to the gun. Okay, um, a, lot of, a lot of problems, and we'll get into a little bit of that in a few minutes. It had a crew of 10, bombardier, navigator, pilot, co-pilot. The four officers sat up front. By the way, it just happened to work out that the front of the aircraft was the only part that was heated. <laughs> Enough said. I was an enlisted guy in the Navy. I understand that. Officers get the warm air, right? Okay, so that's where the four officers sat. Uh, and then you had the gunners and, and the radio operator. So you've got a top turret gunner. Now that would be your flight engineer. He was the guy who knew how everything worked on the plane and he could fix everything. Or, or if he couldn't fix it, it wasn't gonna get fixed. Probably the most dangerous job, ball turret gunner, 
we'll talk about that in a little bit. Waist gunners, two of those and a tail gunner. So you had 10 men in a plane. Later in the war, you reduced that to nine because you were able to, um, well, excuse me, you increased it to 11 because you added a radar operator in here for radar bombing. But that was very late in the war. Similar bomber, a different look, was the B-24. Some of you are familiar with that one, the Liberator. Had a twin tail, had a, a big high, um, high wing, very narrow, it's called the Davis wing. Looked a lot different, I've got a picture of it later. Same configuration of men, 10 men and a bomber. Uh, it could carry a few more bombs, a little bit faster, a little bit higher. Problem with a B-24, was that they, they tended to not be able to take quite as much battle damage. This thing could, could come back literally on one engine if it had to. When I grew up, my father had been a bombardier in the 8th Air Force. He flew in B-17s. He used to say he had the best seat in the house, best view, and he was also the first guy back from every mission. So that was kind of his way of justifying being up there. Okay. My godfather was a pilot who flew B-24s in, out of Italy, Foggia, Italy. So I grew up in a boat fishing in Minnesota with my godfather and my dad in the boat talking about the difference between a B-17 and a B-24. Well, the B-24 has that high Davis wing and it flies a lot faster. Yeah, but the B-17 can take more damage. I grew up listening to this every time we went fishing. Same arguments every time, never got anywhere. I, I, that's where I learned the term ad nauseum which means, you know, until you, you're ready to get sick. So, I was about 16 years old when the argument finally ended, when uh, one day my dad looked at my godfather and he said, the last thing I'm going to say is that the B-24 was the packing crate a B-17 was shipped in. <laughs> and my godfather, his lips were moving, but no words were coming out. <laughs> and so that, that was the last time I, re I actually remember them talking about that. So. Um, yeah, so I learned early on the difference in these aircraft. B-24, it was 74 feet long. What I love is the wingspan, 103 feet 9 inches. 30 years before the B-17 flew, actually 35 years, basically, before the B-17 flew, the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk. First man flight, a powered aircraft. How far did they fly at first flight? 100 feet. They flew the wingspan of a B-17. So a generation later, we're putting thousands of planes into the air okay, with four engines that can go a half a continent away and back and can drop these tremendous bomb loads and stuff just, just 30, 35, 40 years after the Wright brothers had flown. That's a marvelous, you know, marvelous span, short span and, and great increase in, in, uh, in engineering. And I look at that and that's continued today. When you compare a B-17 well, I can, do, I can give you this number. All of the armament dropped in World War II by all of the countries. We're talking everybody. Friendlies and, you know, the Axis powers and the Allies. Everything, including the two bombs on Japan. If you take all of the destructive power of that, it equals one warhead out of eight on a missile, out of 24 missiles, in one American nuclear submarine. Okay, and I, I just know that because my youngest son is an officer on a nuclear sub, a ballistic submarine. And each, war, each missile, they have 24 missiles, each missile has eight warheads. Each warhead has the same power as everything that was expended in World War II. And that's controlled by 79 guys, you know, on a submarine. So that's, it, it, it's kind of, it's scary, but at the same time, I'm glad they're on our side, you know what I mean? I'll try not to hit the mic again, Mike, sorry. Okay. So, when you have all of these planes in the air, you have to maintain a proper formation. Why? Well, so that when the lead bombardier drops his bombs, everybody else drops their bombs on his. So you get this concentration of, of destruction down below so they're not scattered all over the state. And their defensive firepower. Uh, when they're flying in formation, his guns are actually helping to protect these planes. His guns are helping to protect these other planes. So you get these fields of fire and enemy fighters don't want to come into that because they're going to get hit. One of the dangers of being out of formation is this. If you'll notice, 
the plane above this, pl now this plane, the lower plane here is out of formation. It's not where it's supposed to be flying. And here's the danger. I'm dropping my bombs just like I should, and one of them hits the left stabilizer of this aircraft. Knocks the aircraft off, there's the bomb that hit it, and down goes the plane. Now these are three consecutive frames of movie film that are shot at 24 frames a second. So there's what, a twelfth of a second. Would that be right? Anyway, it's two, three frames would be like a twelfth of a second between this one and this one. And it shows how already the plane is out of control immediately. You do not knock off that left stabilizer and the plane starts to drop and then it goes into this flat spin. It's called augering in. And the centrifugal forces will keep you from exiting that plane. So that plane crashed with 10 men on it. 10 guys dead because they were in the wrong spot. That's how important it is. And you can imagine if you've got a flight of 600 of these bombers in the air in one formation and enemy fighters are coming in, how important it was and how stressful it was for the pilots to maintain formation. There were times when you would fly in a tight formation, you would be less than 30 feet from the next plane. These are big planes, 103 feet you know, wide, 74 feet long, and you've got to be within 30 feet of the plane next to you. It was nerve-wracking. My father would describe a bombing mission as being eight hours of absolute boredom punctuated by three minutes of sheer terror. <laughs> because when the fighters came, when you had to make your bomb run, etc., that's when the terror started. Our first bombing mission was in July of 1942. I mentioned those 13 guys got there in March. In May, we started getting planes. By July, we had 12 bombers. So they decided we're going to fly a mission. Well, they took off from this airfield at, uh, I think that one was at um, Abbey, Abbey, I can't remember, Abbey something Abbey. Yeah, anyway, it was, it was the main, it was the first base we had. Now it's going to bug me through my whole talk until I get it. But these 12 planes take off. One of the guys who was there observing was an RAF officer who'd been working, he was liaison, he'd been working with the 8th Air Force, and he was Scottish, and he was very conservative, and he said, you might as well make your goodbyes now because you're not going to see any of those bombers return. None of them are going to come back. They're unescorted. We had no fighter escorts at that time. And we're flying 12 planes by themselves into France. So they flew to a, the town of Rouen, France. They were attacking an airfield there. The 12 planes made it to Rouen, France, bombed, came back, never saw a German fighter because of the element of surprise. Okay, the Germans did not think we would even consider launching an attack when they knew all we had were 12 planes there. They knew that. There were enough spies in England to let them know what was going on. So when the planes came back and all 12 landed, this, Scott, this Scottish officer was the, the first guy. He was the most excited. See, I told you they'd all make it back. <laughs> you know? So we learned again a difference between the British and, and American attitudes. It was, that raid was so successful that they planned another one for three days later. Twelve planes took off and nine made it back. And we lost three. Three out of twelve, twenty-five percent. One quarter of our force did not come back. That rate pretty much kept up until 1945. So for three years, two and a half years, we were losing about one in four aircraft over Germany. Or over France and then later over Germany. By the way, um, the guy who piloted the very first plane in the 8th Air Force to take off on a mission had the rank of major. He was the command pilot of that plane. He actually headed up that mission, although General Ira Eaker flew along as an observer. The mission was actually commanded by a major. Anyone hazard a guess as to who that major might have been in 1942? If you know, if you know uh, Air Force history, if not, I'll tell you. But I always give people a chance to guess things. Anybody ever heard of a guy by the name of Paul Tibbetts? Yeah. He flew the Enola Gay over Hiroshima. He flew the first mission. He commanded the first mission. First plane to take off over German airspace. It was France, but it was controlled by the Germans. So that was in August of 1942. <laughs> This just gives you an idea of what it looked like from the air 
as they were hitting small marshalling yards. Now, that's kind of fast forwarding to March of 1945. But by March of 1945, we were literally running out of targets. We had, they were, they were now at this point in the war, we're aiming at small to medium sized marshalling yards in their railway system. We'd already destroyed all of the big ones. We had destroyed their synthetic oil refinery systems. The German Luftwaffe was still able to make planes but they had very few pilots at the end of the war because they couldn't train them and they had no fuel so their planes could not take off with the exception of one aircraft and that was the ME-262, their jet aircraft because it used kerosene and not aviation fuel as a fuel and they could make kerosene. Problem was uh, the ME-262 while it was developed in time to actually perhaps change the course of the war Hitler had determined he wanted it to be used as an offensive weapon, as a fighter bomber, not as a fighter. Had they, and so that caused a delay in the production of these things. Had he not made that decision, uh, they would have had more ME-262s at a time when we had nothing to, to, to fight against them. A Mustang was 100 miles an hour slower than a jet-propelled ME-262. And so, Germany could have really prolonged the war. I'm not saying they would have won the war with their wonder weapons, but they could have prolonged the war had Hitler not made some of his bonehead decisions that he made. In fact, he was making such terrible decisions by the fall of 1944 that Winston Churchill actually ordered his special operations executive, SOE, what we would call the CIA in the United States, he ordered his own people to stop trying to kill Hitler. Because he said, if we kill Hitler, better decisions will be made in Germany. <laughs> so he was the best thing we had going for us <laughs> by the end of the war. Was because he had he'd just gone off his rocker so much, to use a, a Minnesota expression, I guess. But it gives you an example of the destruction that these bombers would do. Dropping these 500 pound bombs, and you're dropping hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these bombs as a formation goes over. It was horrendous. Um, so, during, during the bombardment in Europe, there were two sets of victims. Those who were bombed, people on the ground, and the men who bombed them. And you have to really view them as, as both being victims. The air crews themselves were victims okay, of the war. Not only because of enemy fire, the psychological aspect, the, the, the environment they were fighting in. Never before had we flown men at 35,000 feet in the air in unpressurized planes and expect them to fight, literally fight, because of enemy fighters and anti-aircraft and everything else. These guys were fighting and dying. One of the biggest problems no one had anticipated that they discovered early on, and my father uh, in, in his early missions discovered this with a crewman of his, the navigator in his plane, another officer up front, the guy got wounded. Uh, a piece of, uh, a flak burst, an anti-aircraft shell went off, pieces of it came through the plane, missed my dad, but the navigator got hit. But he didn't think he was hit badly. He was sitting up, talking, he had a, he had a tear in his, in his, in his um, bomber coat, excuse me, <laughs> his flight suit, but the bleeding stopped. And so he thought he was fine. Okay, what had happened was the blood had frozen and that caused the bleeding to stop. So my dad was talking with the navigator. The navigator was doing his job, navigated back. They got back over the coast of France. 
came over the English Channel, started dropping in altitude, getting ready to land, and suddenly the navigator got kind of woozy in his chair and fell on the floor, and with, before they even landed, he was dead. He had bled to death because the blood had thawed and started bleeding again. And that was one of the problems with flying at altitude, was you could be wounded and not know how badly. But as soon as you landed, you'd start leaking blood everywhere because it had frozen at altitude. It was just horrendous. Some of the, the things that these guys didn't anticipate, no one thought about that. They didn't realize that would happen. Um, casualties in the 8th Air Force. The 8th Air Force, by the way, by the end of the war, we had um, 16 air forces around the world. I've got a collection of the World War II Air Force patches over here to look at. They weren't all numbered consecutively because we went basically 1 through 15 and then 20. 20 was the, the first strategic air force. That was the B-29s that, that attacked Japan. So it was the beginning of a new air force when we developed the B-29 bomber. But um, out of those 16 air forces, the 8th Air Force was one half of all of the Air Force, was in the 8th Air Force. So it was, it was as big as the other 15 combined. Okay, the 8th Air Force was huge, but it had a pretty big job to do. Therefore, because it was half of the Air Force, half of all the casualties during World War II happened in the 8th Air Force. They had 26,000 killed in action. 26,000. What do you do with a number like that? We'll get there in a minute. Bear with me. 30,000 plus, we had more than 30,000 who were captured prisoners of war, including my father. The total Western, all of the prisoners of war from France, England, Canada, Belgium, the Netherlands, all the countries, all of them that Germany held, and Italy, all of the prisoners of war were 232,000 total from all the different countries. And our 8th Air Force constituted 30,000 of those, one eighth of all of the, the prisoners of war that Germany held, other than the Russians. Okay, you can't count the Eastern ones, this is just Western powers. Your chances of surviving, if you were in the 8th Air Force in a bomb crew, in, if you were part of a crew in a bomber, your chances of surviving were one in three without being wounded, captured, or dead. That means two out of every three were either wounded, captured, or dead. Nobody else had. The closest any other group had to these numbers were the Marines in the Pacific. Okay. And, and we'll, we're going to do a little bit of a comparison of them here on the next slide. If you take the 8th Air Force, 350,000 men, these 350,000 men were only the air crews. This didn't count the ground crew, ground echelon, or support troops. 350,000 airmen, 26,000 killed in action. The Marines, 599,693. That did include support staff, etc. So it, in, it included those Marines who were non-combatant. They had 19,058 killed in action. I included all of the fighting in the Pacific, okay, on the part of the Marines. I'm not taking anything away from them. I'm not. They, they did a tremendous job. I would, I would counter and say that in the air, in the military services in World War II, the deadliest job you could have would be to fly a bomber over Germany from England. That would be the deadliest job you could have. Worst chances of coming home. The Navy, which I was part of later, 4.2 million had 35,000 killed in action. Most of these 35,000, by the way, were killed in the last four months of the war as a result of kamikaze attacks from Okinawa to the end of the war. That accounted for, for nearly 28,000 of the 35,000 were in the last few months of the war. Some of the planes that served in the 8th Air Force, now these numbers are not the number of planes that served, these are the number of planes that were shot down or destroyed through collisions in, the, in the, the fog over England, et cetera. These are the number of planes lost. 1,043 P-47 Thunderbolts, 2,201 Mustangs, 4,754 B-17s were lost over Europe by the 8th Air Force. There was also the 15th Air Force, which was flying out of Italy. These numbers do not, they're not reflected. They don't include the 15th Air Force. But understand that each one of these planes is 10 men. 
not one guy like a fighter. Ten guys. Here's your B-24. This is that high Davis wing and the double tail. 2,112 B-24s were lost in the 8th Air Force. One third of the 8th Air Force was B-24s. Two thirds of the 8th Air Force were B-17s. Those were the two heavies, as they called them, that we flew. 451 P-38s were lost as escorts. And the planes that these guys were fighting against at altitude, now understand, even a P-51 was not pressurized. So it's, it's like 70 below in a cockpit of a P-51 as well. They weren't pressurized. Okay. The first pressurized plane we really had was the B-29. That was the plane where you'd take off from the Marianas Islands and you'd fly in your shirt sleeves, literally, over to Japan and back. Well, you weren't flying in shirt sleeves in these bad boys. We'll, we'll get a look at the uniforms in a minute. Some of their enemies, the ME-110, it was a two-person twin-engine fighter. ME-109, this was the one that about 80% of the planes fighting against our bombers were ME-109s. That was the ubiquitous German fighter right there. JU-88s, which was actually a fighter bomber, uh, Focke-Wulf 190, and eventually they, they made a version of this. It was a high-altitude al high fighter called the TA-4. And the ME-410, which known as the Hornet, came in late in the war. A lot of these were used as night fighters against the RAF because they were big enough to, make, to hold the radar and stuff. There's your ME-262 jet fighter. Didn't see them in great numbers, thankfully, because they were really successful at knocking down our bombers. One of these would come through and they had, they had four 20 millimeter cannons in the nose. They'd come through a formation. They had enough fuel to take off, fly to altitude, fly through a formation one time and then land. They only had to go through once. One of these would go through a formation of B-17s and knock down six or eight bombers. So you can imagine if they'd had these in the hundreds flying it would have decimated our bomber streams. Okay. I think the most insidious one, however, is the JU-88. They would, the Germans took this, they put laterally in the sides of the fuselage, they would mount cannons that fired out the sides of the plane, and they would fly these parallel to our bombers, but out of range of our 50 caliber machine guns, and then they would fire rockets or they would fire these cannons out of the sides of the aircraft into our, into our planes. So you've got JU-88s firing missile or rockets and, and cannon fire from the side. You've got these fighters swarming through your formation. Plus you've got enemy anti-aircraft guns firing from below. It was horrific. That's that three minutes of sheer terror as you're making your final bomb run uh, in these planes. And by the way, when you're on your final bomb run, the plane had to fly perfectly straight and level for the last five or six minutes. And so they would track you. They knew exactly where you were going. And they used what was called a box formation for their anti-aircraft. They would fire all of their guns into a window uh, so many thousand feet high, so many thousand yards wide, that they knew you had to fly through in order to bomb your, your target. So once they figured out what target you had, they would, they would set up this box barrage, and you had to fly right through it, straight and level and you couldn't do anything about it except fly through it. The one thing that, that the bomber crews appreciated about enemy fighters was that you had the opportunity to fire back at them. You could shoot back at a fighter. You couldn't shoot back at anti-aircraft. That was just random. You either got hit or you didn't, and that was the frightening part of that. At least with enemy fighters, you had a chance to fight back. Now this guy is not prepared to go flying. This is, a, this is a tail gunner who's just having his picture taken down in England so that he can send it home to someone because he doesn't have the right equipment on. Here's a guy in an electrically heated suit that was one of the options. About one third of the air crew had a suit that, would, that you'd plug in and it had electric wires in it. Some of the problems, if you bled or you had to go to the bathroom because you would just pee in your suit, because if you went to the P-tube in the back of the plane, remember I told you about the hands freezing? <laughs> so you just go in your suit, your electric, your electric suit would short out. And so you might, you might get hit and suddenly that side of your, your, your suit didn't work anymore. Sometimes they failed to work because you'd fold them up and put them in your duffel bag. 
The next time you unfolded it to put it on, one of those wires had snapped. And so break one wire and it won't work. So most of the guys wore wools. These are, they would wear um, a pair of either silk or cotton underwear. Then they would wear um, like a jumpsuit. And then they would put on their leathers. And the bomber coat is similar to this right here. This would be very similar. This is, it happens to be a knockoff made by Cabela's, but it's the same weight. This is all, all it is is a sheep turned inside out. So um, very warm, but it didn't make you overheat. You wouldn't sweat either, and you're welcome to come up and pick it up later. It took, it took three sheep to outfit each airman. Three complete sheep is what it took to outfit one airman. Because you had pants, you had boots, you had the coat, and you had a hat, and you had gloves or mittens. So three sheep. So my question was, Americans don't like mutton. What'd they do with all the mutton? I mean, if they're killing all these sheep, what'd they do with the meat, right? Who ate all that meat? Because you're looking at millions of sheep gave their lives during World War II. There's not mutton in Spam, okay? So where'd the mutton go? Any, any guesses? Britain got a lot of it. Uh, also Australia and New Zealand and the Marines ate a lot of mutton when they were uh, in, the, in the Pacific because we'd send it to Australia. And Australia was really the supply base for the Marine divisions fighting the Japanese. So the Marines got a lot of the mutton because um, the Navy didn't want it. They got beef. The Navy got beef. So you've got different, different positions. Now these two guys here, the two waist gunners, Although their guns are staggered by about three feet, they're still, with all of the bulkiness, you can see how tight it is in there. That's like two guys standing in a phone booth, okay, outfitted in, in all of this stuff, and they're trying to fire their guns and everything else, so they're constantly bumping into each other. You got the ball turret, oops, excuse me, the ball turret gunner here, usually the shortest guy in the crew, because this ball turret was very small. In fact, you can see he doesn't have all of this leather on. There wasn't room for it. So he would get an electrically heated suit, but he didn't have his flak apron. That wouldn't fit. His parachute wouldn't fit in the ball turret. His parachute was located in the belly of the plane about four feet from his turret. So if the plane got hit, the ball turret gunner would have to rotate his, his ball to where the guns were pointing straight down. He would then open a door, climb up into the plane, find his parachute, which might be covered in all of these empty shell casings, so he might have to find his chute, get it on and get out of the plane. How long would that take? Too long. Too long, because the average amount of time from the time a plane got hit, you had about seven seconds to get out of the plane. Ball turret gunners rarely got out of the plane, rarely. My father's plane was shot down. You'll see pictures of it in a bit. Um, the pilot died because he was trying to keep the plane under control so everybody could get out. And the ball turret gunner died. Probably could not find his chute. And so he died. Pinned up against the side of the, the fuselage as it went into that final spin. Flak, Flieg, Flieger Abwehr Kanonen, anti-aircraft cannons in German. Flak. The German 88, probably the best weapon the Germans developed during World War II. If you fired it level, it would destroy a Sherman tank at four miles. If you could see that far. In Europe, you couldn't. But in, the, in, the, in North Africa, you could see four miles. They were picking off our Shermans under the British at four miles away. Straight up, it would fire a shell 39,000 feet. That's about a nine-pound shell that it would fire 39,000 feet. They were always in batteries. You can see there's two more guns there. They would normally be in a battery of four. So there's a gun directly behind this in a diamond pattern. All four guns would fire together on the coordinates given them by a radar spotter. So they'd fire by radar so they knew what altitude to fire at. This one's pretty successful. There's 13 stripes on its barrel, so it's knocked down 13 enemy aircraft that battery, those four guns, because you can see, if you look closely, there's these white patches on the barrels. All of them have the same 13 stripes on that battery. 
Okay. And then you've got the bigger gun, the 105 millimeter. This fired a nine pound shell. This one fired about a 13 pound shell, but it would only fire at 37,500. But it was a bigger, bigger shell. I mean, it would do more damage. If you got shot down, bad things happened. This plane, you can see the entire nose is gone. All four officers are missing out of that plane. That plane, this picture was taken a split second before it started spinning in. Okay. So nobody survived out of that plane. No chutes were seen to open out of that one. This plane, the nose is blown off. Um, the left hand, the um, right hand, left hand co-pilot um, is survived. The pilot's gone, right seat. The bombardier and navigator are both blown out of the aircraft. My dad was a bombardier. He'd have been sitting in that chair uh, you did not, as a bombardier navigator, you didn't wear your parachutes during, during your mission. You didn't have them clipped on. Gunners were supposed to, but a lot of them did not because they couldn't move around as well. They'd have them close by, but the bombardier navigator had to move around the nose so much in the course of their duties that they never wore, they rarely wore their, their chutes while they were flying. And so this guy would have been sucked out of the plane or blown out of the plane without a chute. Hopefully he died on impact, well, when the shell went off. This plane, early in the war, and I forgot, I have a stars and stripes with the article about this plane. This is actually in North Africa, you can tell by the, the circle around the star. This bomber got hit, it was attacked by an ME-109 fighter. The waste gunner killed the fighter pilot, but the plane, the German plane, continued to fly, and it sliced through the B-17 through the fuselage, 150 miles from their base. So the pilot told, immediately told the tail gunner, get up front because we're all gonna bail out. The plane's gonna go down, we're gonna bail out. The tail gunner moved about three feet forward and that tail started doing this. And he knew that he couldn't make it any further forward without endangering the lives of the crew. So the tail gunner, and their intercom was still working. The tail gunner said, no, he said, I, you guys go ahead and bail, I, I can't. I'll kill us if I move. So to a man, the rest of the crew said, well, we're not leaving Fred. So we'll fly it as long as we can and see what happens. And there was another plane obviously flying alongside because it's taking pictures. Well, there's other pictures of this plane. The guys, the crewmen, the two waste gunners and the radio men come back and they open up a parachute and they start cutting risers, the lines out of the parachute, and they start tying the fuselage together <laughs> in the hopes that it'll hold long enough. This plane flew 120 miles, landed at its airfield. When it landed, it came to a complete stop and then went <laughs> and the tail gunner crawled out <laughs> and everybody else got out, everybody survived. And that's what, that's, uh, to me, that's a perfect example of what my dad believed about the B-17. She'd always bring her guys home. If she could, she'd bring them home. You know, so my dad loved this aircraft. If you were shot down and you were fortunate enough to survive being shot down, most did not survive it. If you did, you became a guest of the Third Reich and you were issued an identity card and a new set of dog tags. Now, if, if some of you like to collect militaria from World War II, you can get these on eBay, you can get these on eBay, but you pay absolutely through the nose to get a set that have the same four digits here as on the card here. Excuse me, here, this number. And um, sometimes I bring a shadow box that I have of my dad's things. When my dad was liberated from prison camp by the Russians, he, he broke into, along with uh, several other Allied officers, they broke into the Commandant's office, rifled through the file drawers, and got their ID cards. So I have my dad's German dog tags and his Kriegi card, it's called, and they both have the same serial number. So I have that as a display of, of my dad. This happens to be Stalag Luft 1. It was where officers went. So if you were shot down, your crew would be divided into the officers and the enlisted men. The officers normally went to Stalag Luft 1. It's up on the Baltic Ocean. You couldn't escape because the only place you could go would be to Sweden and it was about 80 miles away across the Baltic. 
You couldn't swim that. You, there was no way. So it was a pretty escape-proof prison. Eventually, by the end of the war, they had 10,000 Allied officers um, in Stalag Luft I. And there's lots of stories about that. I won't go into those. I can. Um, about almost, uh, well, about a year and a half ago, I got an email from a guy. Um, I had looked on the 401st Bomb Group's website online, and, and all of these, these military unit websites, a lot of them have threads, um, emails that people send in about, oh, my dad did this, my dad did that. And there was a thread that included a, an email from a guy in Germany whose father had been a photographer for the German army, actually a German Luftwaffe, the Air Force. His job was to take pictures of downed Allied planes. So when they came across the wreckage of a plane, he would go out and take pictures of it to document it. But by the end of the war, things were so chaotic that nobody ever came to get all of these photos that this guy had taken. So his son ended up with these boxes of photos of our planes all over the ground in Germany. So the guy said he was having a hard time identifying this plane that had the call letters of P-I-Y. And I wrote him, and this, but this email had been sent three years earlier. Okay. So I wrote that, I, I responded to that email thinking, well, I'll never hear back from the guy because it's been three years, right? He's probably got a different email address. I wrote him and said, P-I-Y did not exist as a call letter. There were, that, you've got them backwards. You have to switch them. It's I-Y-P. I-Y-P happened to be 446310 Rocky Lois was the name of the plane. That's the plane my father was in when it was shot down. When he was shot down, this was his plane. I got really excited. And I thought, oh, in three years, maybe I'll get an answer, right? Well, you know how when you send an email, if, if you're sending it to a bad address, it comes back instantly, like, non that didn't happen. So I got even more excited. I thought, okay, now I am going to get a response because it's still a good email address. I went out into the kitchen to pour myself a cup of coffee. I was just doing research. And my computer dinged, which means I got an incoming email. I go back. It's the guy. The photographer's son is online at that time in Germany. He says, well, I can send you the photos. <laughs> In a, in a year and a half now, and it, it's really odd, like the, the cameraman in the back, Mike, hi Mike, his name is Michael. My name's Michael. Both of our fathers served in enemy air forces during World War II. We're both within months the same age. He and I, in a year and a half, have identified over 300 downed Allied aircraft through the photos his dad took. And the two of us together working in tandem across two continents, I've ne we've never met each other, Okay, but together through the internet, we've identified hundreds of these aircraft and we've been posting the results on their websites for the different units. As we identify a plane, we'll go to that. If that squadron or that group has a website, we'll go on there and, and say, we have photos available of this plane. If your father or grandfather was in this plane, that type of thing. And, and I like to think it's given closure to a lot of veterans themselves, guys who served, although they're becoming Fewer and fewer, I understand. So for me, I wish my dad could have seen these pictures. You know, however, they came about 15 years too late for that. Uh, I do have a picture, though, that my dad has seen. In a book by a guy named Edward Jablonski, he wrote on the B-17s, he had a chapter about being a prisoner of war. In that chapter in his book, he had this photo. Now, I didn't draw the circle around him. My dad did. That's him. That's my father in Stalag Luft I, and he remembers about a week, before, a week or two before the Russians came, so to be mid-April of 45, the Red Cross came through taking photos that the prisoners were being treated decently. So that I'm sure the Commandant knew the war was coming to an end, so he arranged for the Red Cross to come in and take pictures so that he wouldn't be tried as a war criminal, etc. Whatever. My dad pointed out to me, he said, well, he was standing in a chow line, and they said, you, 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 come here, we're going to take your picture. So they, they put him, this is not a prisoner of war barracks, this is actually a German guards barracks. And the way you can, the reason you can tell is because it's not lifted off the ground. Stalag Luft I, all of, the, all of the barracks were off the ground. They were on, on legs, so you couldn't tunnel out. 
right? They were open underneath, so the guard dogs could go under the barracks. This is a German guards barracks. This is their, the German guards garden, not a, not a prisoner's, a Kriegis garden. So I asked my dad, I said, well, you know, you look like you're kind of, if you, and you can't see it on this photo, you can if you see the original and you zoom in on it. He's got kind of this smirk on his face. It's not, a, it's, it's not a happy smile, but it's an odd look. I asked him about that and he said, well, he said, he's got the hand you can't see, his right arm is reaching down, he just pulled a rutabaga out of the ground in this garden. And he's waiting for the right moment to slip it in his pocket when nobody's looking. And he's, <laughs> he said, I said, so did you get to eat the rutabaga? He goes, no. He said he had to drop it because he didn't have the opportunity to put it in his pocket. But he said the next two weeks, all he could think about was that rutabaga and what it would have tasted like. You know, <laughs> he'd been a POW for nine months at that, at that point. Um, so that was, that was just kind of cool. But this, so this is my dad. He's on the cover of my book, Colors in the Air. That's my mom. That's actually their wedding photo. Um, taken, they both graduated together in 1941 from high school. My dad went to Dunwoody School, started there in the fall of 1941. So when the war began, he was at Dunwoody studying electronics and he applied, he, he went into the Air Force and the Air Force put him on a one year delay so that he could finish his degree at Dunwoody, finish his schooling there. Then he went into pilot training. Well, before he finished pilot training, they knew by 1943 that they had enough pilots in training to basically fulfill what they needed. So they talked him into becoming a bombardier because of his electronics background. So he got to use the Norden bomb site, which was this computerized bomb site. It was the most secret thing ever developed in America until the atomic bomb, until the Manhattan Project. The Norden bomb site was an amazing piece of equipment. If you want to see one, you can either go to the Minnesota History Museum. They have one that you can look at when it's on display, or you can ask to look at when it's not. Or you can go to Jostens in Owatonna, because if you walk into the main, off, the main entrance of Jostens in Owatonna, there's one in a display case, because that's where they assembled parts of it. They used jewelers to assemble these things. So they would use Jostens. That was one of the things Jostens jewelers, besides class rings, they also made Norden bomb sites for the war. But that's in a talk I give on the home front where, <laughs> where I talk about different companies and stuff. So any questions, comments? I know we, we skipped over a lot of stuff. I didn't talk about a lot of the missions and, and the horrible aspects of it. I mean, honestly, it gets pretty bad. Sir? I wondered uh, how high were they bombing from and did they, why did they have to be in formation uh, and would they bomb at different levels? Uh, well, they, they would. They wouldn't all fly at the same level. They would fly in a box formation which would stagger by several thousand feet from the bottom to the top and they were also angled back. So you'd have a flight here, a flight here, a flight here, and a flight here. What they would do is because of the difference in altitude and uh, that way they're not bombing into each other or on top of each other ideally. And they had it figured out that the bomb, the lead bombardier would be in the uppermost, you know, the high, the high position. When he dropped his bombs, everybody else could see that plane. When the lead bombardier toggled his bombs, all the other bombardiers would toggle at the same time. And because of the difference in the, the lateral difference of, al of, of distance and altitude, the bombs would land at the same point. That was how they figured out their formation. And so, or theoretically in the same point. Now, the brag was made about the Norden bomb site that at 10,000 feet you could drop a bomb in a pickle barrel. Well, you couldn't. Well, number one, you weren't bombing at 10,000 feet over Europe. You're usually about 25 to 30,000 feet. You couldn't drop it in a pickle barrel, but what you could do um, over Europe at 25,000 feet, you could drop a bomb in a baseball field. Okay, which it's a dumb bomb it doesn't navigate on its own. You're dropping it and you've got sometimes as many as seven different air directions and velocity between you and the ground. The wind is blowing at different, different speeds from different directions. This thing would take all of that into account, this, this analog computer, the Norden bomb site. And you could, uh, theoretically and ideally, you could drop a bomb inside a baseball field from 30,000 feet up. 
that you could hit a factory from 30,000 feet. Was it? Is your father still living? No, he passed away in 1997. Did he ever go back to he did. Germany? To he did. He went um, uh, for their 50th anniversary in 91. Um, after, they after they had their 50th reunion for high school, uh, it happened that that the bombing un their unit the next year, so 92, they had the 50th. The 401st Bomb Group went over in 1942. So they had a 50 year reunion in Deanthorpe. And, you know, my parents grew up in the Depression, so it was like, oh, we're not going to go. It's not worth going. You know, and oh, we'd have to find a place to stay. Oh, we'd have to rent a car. Oh, we'd have to. So I have, I'm one of four kids. So. My wife and I and, uh, and my brother, we all have timeshare, and so we, even then we had timeshare. So we donated, we got my parents a month worth of timeshare, my sisters took care of getting them their air tickets and getting them their passports, and we sent them to his 50th reunion. And he was so glad he went, you know, because that was about five years before he died. If you ever get the opportunity and you go to Savannah, Georgia, which is where the 8th Bomber Command was formed, there's the 8th Air Force Museum is in Savannah, Georgia. And it is an amazing, amazing museum about the 8th Air Force. One of the things they have is a diorama of an airfield about the size of this room. The model B-17s are about so big, and they've got all of them. It's a, it's a, it's a full air base, and it happens to be the air base of the 401st Bomb Group, the group my dad was in. And I went down for the Olympics in 96, and I had a big, you know, one of the, the camcorders that you had to, you know, like, you need a truck to take with you. But, and I'm videotaping this, this diorama when suddenly I noticed that all the planes had a triangle S on the tail. And I, I'm getting excited on the video. And I found out that the guy who had written a book, all of the proceeds of his book in the 1980s, he had donated to building this museum. His name was Roger Menzel. Um, he flew in the 401st the same bomb group as my dad. So that's what they built was Dean Thorpe, the base at Dean Thorpe. So I came home and I showed my dad that video and gave him a copy of Roger Menzel's book. Well, my dad died six months later. But he, I, he watched that video. He looked at that thing every day. My mom said he'd get up in the morning and every morning he'd put that video in and, and just look at this, this model of his air base. You know? So he was still living it. My dad was a guy that never shared a single story with my mom or any of my siblings about the war other than the bantering with the B-17, B-24. But he never talked about being a prisoner of war. He never talked about any of his missions until I got out of boot camp in the Navy. When I got out of boot camp, he told me all of it. And there's some of it, some of the stuff in the book, which I won't tell you, you have to read it. It's, it's pretty terrible stuff that he saw. And he, he made me, when he told me, he said, you can never tell your mom, or your siblings, as long as your mother and I are alive. So I'm like, great, sworn to secrecy, all this stuff. So when my mom passed away in 08, I was able to tell my siblings, and then I could actually write the book. After she had, in honor of my dad, I, I waited until my mom passed away to write the stories down. My siblings, honestly, they didn't believe a lot of the stuff I told them. And, and so, you know, I had, to, I had to come up with the evidence to corroborate a lot of the stories, you know. And, and some of them are, my dad once saw two British pilots get beaten to death during interrogation by the Germans, and the Germans never asked him a single question. And, and they did this to, I think, to intimidate my dad and this other officer that were going to be questioned next. And my dad is like, he's a 21-year-old kid and he's like thinking he's going to die you know and and so the germans came out this german interrogator came out covered in blood lights up a lucky strike hands my dad the pack says you know you want a cigarette luckies were smoked by the officers where do you get those you know and he sat down and he this german looked at my dad and he said we like americans but we don't think much of the british <laughs> I mean, just beating these two RAF pilots to death with baseball bats. Louisville Slugger baseball bats. Made in the United States baseball bats. You know, because this guy, this, this German officer had lived in St. Louis during the 30s and was a real St. Louis Browns fan. Loved baseball. And, 
you know, my dad said it was so weird being interrogated by this guy. You know, they knew, they knew what high school my dad had graduated from. They knew his nickname for my mom. And my dad's like, how in the world? What could I possibly tell them when they knew that already about me? You know, and he said, it's just the whole thing was just so disarming that they had this information. Where did they get that? You know, well, after the war, we found out that the Germans were importing thousands of newspapers through Portugal, which was a, a neutral country. And they had thousands of people in Germany whose job it was to go through American newspapers, cutting out articles about officers like wedding announcements, graduation announcements, homecoming things. And, they were main and there were no computers, remember. They're maintaining physical files on all of these allied officers. It was amazing <laughs> that they could do that, you know. <coughs> but the Germans are very methodical people. I know, I'm German, <laughs> you know. We're, Wasn't the Norton bomb site partly designed by Honeywell? Yes, oh yeah, yeah, part of it, yeah, it was. It was actually designed by a Belgian under contract to the U.S. It was originally designed for the U.S. Navy, but the Navy had no high altitude bomber to use it in, and it didn't work at lower altitudes as well because you were, you were moving too fast over the ground. The, your relative ground speed was too fast. So it was, it was best used at that 30,000 foot level. It was a, an amazing, amazing machine. About a year ago, I was talking to a pilot that, that uh, flew a B-17. So I don't remember now exactly what part of England, but he always hoped that the B-24s were in there for in their lower. formation, yeah, they would fly under the 17s. He says, and the German pilots would go after the 24s, yeah. and he says, they left us alone. Yeah, and you know, and that's true. And, mm -hmm. and, and part of the reasoning there was that 24s were actually easier to shoot down. Well, yeah, that's that wing. Well, yeah, that Davis wing, wing. And yeah, it would. It would just crack. And Yes, ma'am? Well, wouldn't the markings that they put on the planes make it easier to get a target? Well, I'm sure. <laughs> but it, but but the need to identify them for our own purpose outweighed the advantage that the Germans yeah. would have. Wasn't the Messerschmitt or something like that the plane? Yeah, the ME-109. It's Messerschmitt 109. Oh. Sorry, I use the abbreviations, but yeah, they had Messerschmitts and Focke-Wolfs, mm -hmm. or Focke-Wolf. If you're a German, it would be Focke-Wolf. Yeah, but but yeah, the Messerschmitts. Yeah. Yep, and the 109 was, was the main one. Sir? Uh, Anti-aircraft fire. Flak, two-thirds of them were shot down by flak. Mm -hmm. One-third were shot down by enemy aircraft. So, yeah, it was about a two-to-one. So the flak was what you really, really, really didn't like. You know, the fighters you could at least shoot back at. You know, and, um, but the flak was just totally impersonal. Mm -hmm. my, dad, my dad got one Purple Heart. Um, mm -hmm on a mission, he was, he was flying on a mission and he had gotten up off his seat, that seat that you saw in the front of the nose on that one picture, used to sit, it, it was called a, um, the kind of, of, of fitting, it's, I think it's called a gimbal and socket or something, but anyway, it was a sharp point with the seat on it. So that seat would rotate and kind of move in just about any direction. And, and so it wasn't a flat bearing. So the seat didn't just move this way, it would move forward so he could lean forward and lean back in it and all this. And he was actually over his bomb site, so he's off the seat. And a shell went off, and a piece of flak came through, and it knocked the seat off, this spike. And my dad sat down <laughs> and got the spike in his cheek. And again, at altitude, it hurt. He said it hurt like the devil for just a couple minutes, and then it like, didn't bother him anymore. So he's, he figured it wasn't that bad. They got down, and all of a sudden he started feeling woozy from loss of blood. They got him into an ambulance, got him to the hospital, gave him some blood. He was in, he was in the base hospital for about two weeks with that injury. And an officer comes by one day and is going to pin a purple heart on his pillow and award him with the purple heart. And my dad said, you get out of here. He says, I don't want anybody to know I got a purple heart for getting jabbed in the butt by a seat. You know? <laughs> And so <laughs> now, now we all know. 
Yeah, now everybody knows. Well, and you know that's okay because he's probably up there laughing about it right now. But, and then when he was captured, um, he was captured by two German farmers in a field, uh, uh, a farmer and his grandson. The, the dad was probably in the army, but the son was a teenage boy, and then his grandfather, and they'd been out, shovel, they'd been out forking manure in their, in their fields. So when they captured my dad, you know, they told him, hand a hawk, get your hands up. Well, my dad went to hit his parachute release, his harness release button. The farmer probably thought he was going for a gun or something and jabbed him in the butt again with a pitchfork that he'd been using on manure all morning. And so when my dad got to prison camp a week later, he was pretty infected, and, but it cleared up for the most part. He didn't have a lot of problems with that. He did have ulcers. He had most of his stomach removed at one point because of the food they, he ate, he ate bread that contained ground glass and sawdust and, you know, floor sweepings and that kind of stuff. And, you know, and the, the tension of it, when, when my mom, um, my mom met the ship in Boston that was bringing back the prisoners of war after the war, uh, my dad walked up to my mom. He saw her on the pier and walked up to her and she didn't know who he was until he spoke because he had lost so much weight and his hair had gone snow white while he was over there. And so she didn't recognize him, you know, and they were married, they got married on a Sunday afternoon and my dad left the next morning for bombardier training and didn't come home again for almost three years. And so she said she was married to this guy for one night and had to learn to love a different guy because he was different when he got back and he didn't sleep through the night for almost 10 years. He, he had nightmares for quite a while about different things. And, um, but he was always my dad. I mean, I didn't know him before. You know, I was born in 55, 10 years later. And, um, you know, so uh, he was just always my dad. But my, they were married uh, 57 years before he passed away. So a successful, successful, you know, um, marriage. But, sir. How many missions did he go on? He, he got shot down on number 12. So his 12th mission, he got shot down, which was about average. You were supposed to, when he was in, it was 30 missions before you rotate. Started out, you had to fly 25 missions and then rotate. Well, they were losing, uh, they, were, they were losing almost one in four planes every mission. What were your odds of flying 25 successfully? You know, and uh, then they upped it to 30 and then eventually at the end of the war, it was 35. But that was as we gained control of, of the air more and more. Uh, as we got aerial supremacy, it, it became safer and safer to fly. So they would increase the number of missions. It was, uh, there were some times when they almost stopped the daylight bombing and they almost switched over to nighttime. Almost, a couple of times. Because the raid at Schweinfurt, okay, in August of 42, they flew the first mission. In, in, in August of 43, a year later, they sent 600 bombers against Regensburg and Schweinfurt. So they went from 12 to 600 bombers in a, in a year. And this mission of 600 bombers, they lost 69 yeah. bombers in one day. Bloody Thursday, it was called. And uh, 690 guys. And they, they stopped the production of ball bearings by one afternoon. That's, it, took, it took the Germans less than a day to get back up to full production again. Um, after, you know, and it cost us 690 guys, plus wounded and dead that, that made it back. I mean, that's 690 shot down, you know. Um, so. I remember those headlines. Yeah. Schweinfurt and Regensburg. Oh, they were losing 30, 40 planes yep. a day. Yep, every, every day, time. every day. And, and, you know, it's times 10 men and, yeah. yeah, it was, and then we were flying them out of Italy too and, and you know, all over the place <laughs> and, and losing, losing guys like that. Um, so so if, if you've seen the, the series Band of Brothers, or you've seen the HBO special called The Pacific, there's been these two series made by HBO in the last 10 years. The Band of Brothers is about the 101st Airborne in Europe. Uh, the Pacific is about the Marines in the Pacific. Now uh, Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks are teaming up on an another series. It's supposed to be out this spring and they had production delays, so any time now it should come out. And it's going to be called Masters of the Air. It's about the 8th Air Force. And I'm hoping that it's as good as Band of Brothers or the Pacific, because those are two of the best series I've ever seen on World War II. Yes, ma'am. With all that destruction that they were doing both yes. day and night, were there any 
churches, art museums, anything like that? That survived? survived? Yeah, actually the, uh, the cathedral at, at Cologne miraculously wasn't damaged at all. And it was, all, it was used as naming point <laughs> in several missions, <laughs> which lets you know hey, just how accurate the Norden really was. That, yeah, we're going to aim on this church, and then everything around the church is destroyed, but not the church. So, but yes, there were, there were um, a lot of things were destroyed, but a lot of things survived in Germany. But understand that, you know, a lot of the stuff that was destroyed in Germany also belonged to other countries. The Germans had already been bringing in artwork, and if you watch the movie Monuments Men, yeah, uh, it's, um, I, was, I, I, had the, I was blessed with the opportunity to go to Italy this last May, um, that's why I couldn't speak here the first part of May, um, to do some research on the 34th, the Red Bulls, and what they did in, in art, uh, recovery and restoration work, etc. So I went to uh, the Brera Art Museum in Milan, Italy, and talked to the curator there, and he handed me a, a painting, and he said, we're still working, 70 years later, we're still working on restoring the frame of this painting. He said, it's because of the volume of, of pieces they've had to do in the last 70 years, they haven't got them all finished yet, that were damaged during the war. They're still repairing some of this stuff. I'm like, that's amazing right there. And, and he goes, so what do you think of this painting? And I'm going, okay, I, I'm not a painter. I'm not. I, I, I'm almost colorblind. But it was beautiful. And I said, man, the color, they're so vibrant. I, even I can see them. I said, it looks so real. It, it's like I can put my hand into the picture. And he goes, <laughs> this curator goes, well, we like to think that Leonardo was a pretty good painter. <laughs> and that's when I almost dropped it. <laughs> because I was just, I suddenly got nervous and sweaty hands and the whole thing. I'm holding an original Da Vinci. And I'm like, you know, and, and I'm just a kid from Owatonna, you know, that, that was over there doing some research. It was just amazing, this, this trip I had, that you never know what's going to happen, you know, when you go and, and you go to a, a city or something. And I had just let people know when I got there that I was doing this research on these Minnesota guys. I had a Red Bull hat, 34th Division hat. Number one, only Americans wear baseball caps. That's, nobody in Europe wears a baseball cap. If, if, you, if you got one on, you're an American. You're an American, you know? And I, but people recognized the Red Bull symbol, and they would just start jabbering at me in Italian. I'm like, Phew. I don't understand Italian. But I had a guide, um, kind of a hostess who was with me for the, for the week. Actually, I stayed in her villa with her and her mom, um, a friend of my daughter's. So that's how I got to go. And um, so Vittoria would, would tell these people that I was an author, overdoing research on these Minnesota guys who had been there at the end of the war. And, and I'm getting into all these places that, that you know, you just, it, was, it was cool. And it was because our guys were there 70 years ago returning art that they found. They'd find these caches of art that the Germans had, had stored away to bring to Germany later. And we'd find all this artwork and the Europeans could not believe that we were giving it back to them. They thought we'd just take it all back to America because that's what everybody had done for centuries. Why is the Mona Lisa in Paris if it was painted in Milan? Because <laughs> it was stolen so many times that the French say, oh, it's ours. <laughs> but it's not theirs. It's actually Italy's. You know? <laughs> so anyway, um, that stuff happens. And, you know. All right. Oh, thank you. Really.